to uh, this fabulous event with a very distinguished panel um, on how should the UK challenge China on climate change. So it's going to be a bit of a debate, hopefully, and uh, we would love for you to be uh, very active and ask questions and, and share your opinions as we, as we go along. I'd love to remind you that the Conservative Environment Network has 18 events uh, this part of the conference. Blimey. So, uh, we thought we were special. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, this is obviously the best one. Um, but uh, if you enjoy it, or if you're obviously interested in, in this topic, which I assume you are, please make sure to check out that schedule. Um, right, so we, um, we have a very distinguished panel, as I say. Three members of parliament, which is pretty high for a panel. Uh, so well done, Sen. And thank you very much, um, Bernard, Richard, and um, Mark, for joining us today, as well as Rebecca and James. So before um, I introduce them, um, I'll just lay the scene a bit for, um, for today. So as I'm sure you all know, um, China is obviously a very important part of this um, topic, uh, especially as we head into COP26, which is only four or five weeks away. So um, whether it's from Hong Kong to Huawei, uh, Huawei uh, human rights to Hinkley Point, China is at the forefront of very many policy debates in the UK, but especially the environment. So as they are the l world's largest emitter of CO2 and the largest manufacturing economy, China's role in combating climate change is crucial, but opinion is divided on how the UK and its allies should respond. So how can we engage China on environmental challenges like biodiversity loss and climate change? And should the West unite to use trade sanctions and develop alternative supply chains to combat China's greenhouse gas emissions? And should we allow Chinese companies to run critical parts of the UK's energy infrastructure and control supply chains for important clean technologies? So to tackle these questions, um, we have these fantastic conservative parliamentarians and foreign affairs experts, and they're going to explore China's uh, record on climate and how the UK can respond most effectively. Do we work with them? Do we challenge them more? And how do we approach this at COP26 when the negotiations are obviously front and centre? I realise I haven't introduced myself. I always forget to do that. Uh, I'm Laura Round. Um, I used to be um, a, a special advisor to the Secretary of State for Defence and International Development, and I am a counsellor, and I believe I am an ambassador for SEN, uh, and currently work <coughs> for Freud's and seconda to the Prince's Sustainable Markets Initiative. So, to start off, um, Prince of Wales, we do have multiple princes. Um, to start off, can we start with Richard? Um, we would be particularly interested to hear about your experience of what diplomatic strategies work best with China as the chair of the China APPG. And of course, you are also chair of many other APPGs, but I think you're in particular your role as chair of the China APPG is what we're, you're invited in your capacity to do. Brilliant. Um, well, look, Laura, thank you so much. Laura is going to be an amazing MP before very long. Um, so we'll have you on the other side of the table where everyone can quiz you soon. But it's fantastic <laughs> to be with Sen um, for this great event. And indeed, I think another one later on. This is you know, one of the best things about conservative conferences of the Sen event. So fantastic to see the room full. Um, how long have we got? Because th this is a subject that could go on um, happily for uh, the rest of the week but I guess you want three or four punchy minutes. Yeah, yeah. So let me start, first of all, with July the 20th, uh, last summer, when some of you will be very much aware of what happened on Line 5 of the subway in a city called Zhengzhou in Henan province in central China. 14 people were trapped. These photographs came out of people, you know, for four hours standing there with water up to their necks and so on. 302 people died overall in that flooding, and if ever there was an event that highlighted climate volatility most tellingly for people across China, I think that was it. Um, it's not the only thing, of course, that has been going on in China to highlight climate change and the environment. Uh, the China magazine uh, itself noted that they've had the highest temperatures for 100 years, that the climate has risen by 0.26 degrees centigrade for every decade since the 1950s, which is higher than the global average. The sea levels are up. The glaciers have retreated in uh, Tian Shan, the heavenly mountains, and their coral reefs have been bleached. It's also true, of course, 
uh, that 66% of electricity in China comes from coal power, uh, that they have water shortages in the west, for example, on the edges of the Taklamakan Desert and in the northeast where their heavy industries lie. There's deforestation issues in the southwest. China is the largest source of greenhouse emissions in the world, and it ranks 120 out of 180th on environmental performance by one sort of indicator. So there is plenty for China to get stuck into, plenty of environmental challenges, as you would expect in the world's largest country. So what are they doing about it, and what, we, what can we do to help nudge them all in the right direction? Um, I think the key thing uh, over the last five years is there have been a series of environmental strategies and policies. They brought down sulfur dioxide levels heftily. Since 2017, they've been the biggest investor in renewable energy in the world by a long way, half of the global investment, over 126 billion. And they lead, really, on solar, uh, wind turbine, and now hydrogen sort of manufacturing. Um, now, the two big uh, commitments to COP26 you'll all be aware of, so peak carbon by 2030 and carbon neutral by 2060. Um, the issue on the table is the detail of both of those, and there is a question mark about arguably whether they could improve on either of those commitments. Peak carbon, I think they probably could improve a bit if they wanted to. Um, and then there is the issue of uh, coal and financing of coal-powered stations abroad, where they've made this big commitment at the UN General Assembly last week uh, to withdraw all financing for coal abroad. This, um, of course, the UN Secretary General said, that accelerating the global phase-out of coal is the single most important step to keep the commitments made at the Paris Climate Conference going. And Alok Sharma said that he's, one of his <coughs> goals at COP26 is to consign coal-powered history. So these are huge steps forward. They don't come without some question marks. So, for example, what happens to projects that they've already agreed to finance? <laughs> uh, what happens to private sector financing? What happens where there are co-financing agreements? Um, so there are some questions to be asked, but that is a really important step forward from China. Now, how can we influence them? Let me give you four things where I think we can help China to make a difference to the world. The first one is to encourage. We can encourage more detail on these two big commitments. We can encourage more detail on what's going to happen to the financing of coal projects that have already started, already agreed abroad. Secondly, and this is most important, we can encourage those voices in China, and they are there, for example, Professor Yuan Jihai from the North China Electricity uh, Power University, who has called for an alignment of domestic policy with foreign policy. As he put it, if China wants to be a true leader, there is a need to be consistent with what it does domestically and what it does overseas. We, we would all agree with that. But the important thing is that it's not us, the West, lecturing and hectoring. It's encouraging those voices in China down that direction. Thirdly then, and this I think is a crucial opportunity for us in the UK, we can work together with China on co-financing an enormous drive for renewable energy around the world. The China Development Bank has already operated with various foreign and Western counterparts to do this, but the UK, frankly, has not done as much as we could and should do given the role of the City of London and our international financial reach. So that is a huge opportunity, to, for example, across Africa, to start uh, co-financing renewable projects. Um, fourthly, then, uh, we need to encourage the world's developing nations to make the case about why China needs to do more, and they will be much more effective in that as developing nations like China than we will be. If we do it, the instinctive Chinese reaction is, look, you guys polluted the world for a long time when you had your industrial revolution. We're now having ours, you know, 150 years later, and you know, you're now criticizing us for polluting the world. You know, we don't really want any lectures from you on this. You know, think of the words in Jerusalem and all the rest of it. But if it comes from developing nations, places like the Marshall Islands saying, look guys, hang on, this melting of the glaciers up in the Himalayas above Tibet is gonna have a massive effect on developing nations and countries like ours will be washed away. So please play your part in a major way. 
So we need to encourage the developing nations to make that case for more change in China. And lastly, this all leads to the most important part of the question. Of course we can challenge China on a whole number of things. There are plenty of things to challenge. But we also need to work with them and to have dialogue and to have partnerships if we're actually going to achieve everything. We can feel good about ourselves lecturing China the whole time in the House of Commons and elsewhere. But that is not going to achieve anything. So we need to have that dialogue to build multilateral trust to get the results we want at multilateral climate change conferences like the one coming up. And that is the most single important message I would urge you all to take away. Dialogue, and actually, by the way, the best source of information on what's happening environmentally in China is something called the China Dialogue, which was set up by Isabel Hilton. It's very good, but notice that word, dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. So moving on to James Rogers, who's co-founder and director of research at the Council on Geostrategy, uh, where he specializes in geopolitics and British strategic policy. So James, we would be especially interested to hear your thoughts on what foreign policy tools are available to the UK to improve China's record on climate. Thank you, Laura. So I think there are basically four baskets of tools that we can deploy as a country um, to ensure that China and other countries uh, work towards their environmental um, ambitions and objectives. The first to remember is that domestic policy is in many ways foreign policy. So we need to lead in greening our own economy because the greater the distance we put between ourselves and those that seek to catch up or need to catch up, uh, the greater the pressure we put upon them to do so. Um, so moving ahead is not only about foreign policy, but an integrated national strategy as well, which seeks to push forward um, both in environmental and economic terms. So the point here to be made is that this is not just about greening the economy, it's also about pushing ahead in terms of the so-called fourth industrial revolution and securing many of the technological advantages that come with that, which will in turn uh, push our own economy ahead. And this means that it's not only about the foreign office or what the foreign office can do, um, it's also about all the other um, agencies and departments of uh, HM government. The second thing we need to do, I think, is to work to align others to our environmental uh, cause. We need to formally align other countries to our environmental ambitions, and to do that, the UK should use existing alliances and new security pacts to ensure that environmental matters are taken seriously by our allies and partners. We are a country of broad power and means, and we have the ability here to lead. Moreover, as a custodian of the open international order, we should be actively prepared to ask our allies and partners to enhance their environmental policies in exchange for British strategic and military support. This will create ever greater international pressure on the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, as well as other countries that are lagging behind in terms of their environmental agenda. Third, I think we need to engage more actively in discursive statecraft. What do I mean by that? I mean the ability or the willingness to project narratives at the international level to reshape what people think and what they can act and do. Uh, we need to, for example, counter uh, the Chinese Communist Party's guilt discourses and project a pro-environmental agenda. To begin with, we should push back against the CCP's efforts to deactivate our own interest in the environment and environmental degradation more generally, or convince us that China should be entitled to special treatment. For example, there has been a lot of um, narratives pushed in recent weeks and months about the guilt of the West. But let's remember a few things. We did not know initially what we were doing when the Industrial Revolution kick-started in the UK. Until the 1950s, there was no West as such. The West is a modern development that occurred in the aftermath of the Second World War. Industrialization has been generally for the betterment of humankind. We should not be ashamed of it. And now we can use science and technology to prevent industrialization from causing further environmental destruction. We have moved to do this since 1990, a very important year, and even if we still need to allocate greater resources to achieving it from, for ourselves. And secondly, we also need to develop our own environmental narrative to project at the international level to counter Chinese narratives surrounding Western guilt and to press the Chinese Communist Party over its own environmental abuses, particularly when they affect um, other poorer countries, such as overfishing, the destruction of the oceans and the release of excessive amounts of plastic waste. And finally, I think we need to be ready to punish the CCP and other countries that engage in environmental destruction or do not clean up their acts. 
If the CCP does not improve its environmental policies, we could, for example, impose carbon border, border mechanisms to make it more expensive to import Chinese products into the UK if they can be produced here um, with less environmental damage and therefore supporting our own economy and potentially also helping to level up the, uh, the country. So those, I think, are the four main baskets um, of tools that we have available that we can deploy against or in relation to uh, the Chinese Communist Party, but also a number of other countries that um, pollute excessively or fail to clean up their acts at su sufficient speed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to Rebecca, who is Head of Politics at Greenpeace UK. It would be very interesting if you could share some insights into how the UK and China um, how that relationship is going in the run-up to COP26, and also what can campaigners do? Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca. Good to be here. So I guess I just want to start off by saying that Greenpeace is a global organisation, and we have a number of major offices in China, and indeed actually a far bigger presence there than in the UK. And the operating environment in China, as I'm sure you can imagine, is very different from here, much more limited. So I just want to, uh, to open by saying that um, my comments here reflect that sensitivity coming from a place of respect for the work that my colleagues in China are doing. But despite those limitations, through deploying tactics that are appropriate to the political operating environment that they find themselves in, my colleagues in China and East Asia are having an important impact. Um, they've played an instrumental role in getting air pollution to be taken more seriously, um, similarly with water pollution, and also more recently highlighting the impact of climate change that's happening increasingly across the world. And so they've also played um, a really instrumental role more recently in actually encouraging um, the Chinese government to make the recent announcement to stop um, building new coal power stations abroad and increasing more support for um, developing countries for renewable projects. So whilst, of course, lots more still needs to be done in China, this could actually be a genuinely significant move and send some really important global signals around coal phase-out in the run-up to the COP. Undoubtedly, from an emissions perspective, the most pressing issue for China is its use of coal power, and also its date for peak emissions, as has already been mentioned. To quote one of my colleagues from Greenpeace China, Beijing should drastically reduce coal in its energy system to ensure that emissions peak before 2025. This matters because of the sheer scale of China's emissions. Half of global emissions growth since 1990 came from China. But when campaigners, politicians, diplomats want to approach this issue, it is critical that they think sensitively about the political context in China and tailor their tactics and communications to that context. So to elaborate a bit further, and it has been touched upon a bit already, China doesn't feel responsible for the climate emergency. I'm not here to apologize for them, but they and many other countries feel like they are suffering from a problem that they didn't create. And when we look at the UK's immense historic emissions, we do have to recognize the legitimate basis for this feeling. Although China has recently emitted a huge quantity of emissions, cumulatively over the past two centuries, European countries, primarily the UK and Germany, have emitted far, far more than China. And what's more, the emissions that China has recently been responsible for per capita only overtook the UK in 2014. And this doesn't even account for the UK's consumption emissions, which are those that are emitted abroad as a result of the products that we import into the UK. So this doesn't mean that China's growing use of coal isn't an issue. It doesn't mean that China won't suffer from the impacts of climate change. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't act, take action. And it doesn't mean that there, are pl uh, there aren't plenty of other really important diplomatic issues to engage China on. But understanding and really respecting the context of historic emissions is really critical in taking a sensitive and ultimately more effective approach to campaigning for greater climate action in China. So with this in mind, Greenpeace's experience is that there are three narratives that can help to appeal to Chinese decision makers. And we would say that these should be pushed both within China by activist campaigners there, 
but also from both developed and developing countries. So the first being tackling climate change is good for China. So place more of an emphasis on that rather than um, going on about pointing the finger of blame. Secondly, highlight the value of multilateral approaches and working collaboratively to tackle the challenge. And thirdly, when appropriate, uh, build connections in what we talk about, how we talk, with Chinese narratives, such as community of shared future for mankind and global ecological civilization. So I would say these, these kind of frames and approaches should be applied to diplomacy, to grassroots and civil society campaigning, and also in policy design. So for example, do press China on coal and the need to peak emissions sooner, but do so through those above frames. Don't point the finger of blame. Um, you know, diplomacy needs to be done with humility for the same reason. So that means placing as much time and effort on ensuring that rich developed nations do more for themselves and actually deliver promises, for example, on international climate finance. And also it means listening, for example, more to the asks of the G77, the bloc of developing nations, and actually taking seriously what they're asking for and acting upon that, which will in turn help to garner more political will and momentum globally. And finally, you know, it could mean exploring incentives with different policy tools, so for example, car carbon border adjustment mechanism, but that needs to be done in a collaborative way and as part of a wider trade policy, seeking to design it together with China and thinking about uh, mutual benefits rather than taking a punitive approach. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, moving on to Sir Bernard Jenkin, um, who is currently the chair of the Liaison Committee, but also a very active member of the SEN Parliamentary Caucus and vice chair of the Net Zero APPG and husband of the fabulous Baroness Jenkin. Yes. Um, <laughs> we'd be love to hear a bit more about how you think the golden age policy towards China should evolve and how we can make our supply chains less dependent on China. Well, thank you very much, and I have to follow three excellent contributions, including from my colleague Richard, who um, um, took me on my first visit to China as part of the all-party China group, and a fascinating visit it was too. Um, but it made me understand that um, understanding China is a very, very difficult and, uh, thing. And um, you ask about the golden age, and let me start with that. Um, I wrote a an essay for Rusi about uh, um, 18 months ago, which has stood the, stood, uh, I'm, I'm happy, it, happy it's passed the test of 18 months passage of time. Um, and its headline was, and if you just Google Bernard Jenkin, R-U-S-I, China, it'll come up. And please, uh, if you feel like, feel like it, do read it. Um, it basically, the, the, the golden era between China and, and the United Kingdom ended very abruptly when Theresa May became prime minister. And quite right too there was never a golden era it was a it was it, it was known in the uh, the treasury and the foreign office as operation kowtow and um, th there is certainly a very great deal to be said for exercising patience and restraint in our relationships uh, re relationships i say relationships with china because it's a multifaceted relationship but you've heard from these contributions we've got to reconcile different tensions in our policy with china there's no way we're going to achieve uh, meaningful uh, policy on a global basis uh, to defeat uh, global warming and CO2 emissions without the cooperation of China. But it is with the cooperation of China and indeed by harnessing the support of China, um, I would say not by um, confronting China. Um, and I just want to quote something uh, that we should understand. President Xi in 2021, Leader Summit on Climate, the Chinese civilization has always valued harmony between man and nature, as well as the observance of the laws of nature. It has been our constant pursuit that man and nature could live in harmony with each other. China will follow the thought on ecological civilization, capitals, and implement the new development philosophy. That doesn't seem, that seems to me a very solid thread we should definitely pull on. Um, <laughs> but we need to learn to distinguish, um, I mean, we, we accuse, um, governments and companies of greenwashing. I think China's doing a bit of greenwashing too. And uh, we need to be able to distinguish between 
when they're just doing um, misleading greenery in their geopolitics um, and not actually carrying out what they preach. Important to understand, however, that um, in 27, under Hu Huintao, uh, ecological civilization became an explicit goal of the Chinese Communist Party and is embedded in the party constitution. And the, the term combines ecological Marxism, which might be the, you know, a, a way of socializing nature, um, uh, uh, with um, a kind of constructive postmodernism um, in an attempt to combine chi traditional Chinese culture and modernity, which is what was reflected in President Xi's comment. So there are more than 20 government research centers in China de dedicated to refining these concepts, and they conduct philosophical debates, legal analysis uh, that informs constitutional changes, and economic analysis that cha shapes the five-year plans and national directives. Now, there are plenty of um, people in the West that um, have a, um, a dewy-eyed optimism about all this, which is probably not warranted, um, and um, almost I mean, some Marxists would welcome increased Chinese assertiveness in order to, that these policies should be achieved. I don't think we should do that. Um, uh, I think we have to win a competition of ideas um, in as we develop our climate policy across the world. Um, and the, and the, 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 the competition of ideas is um, democracy and freedom and human rights versus other systems. And we know that China is very confident about their system and indeed the Chinese people, we have to recognize this, most Chinese citizens are very confident about their system. Um, but we have to, that doesn't mean we should give up on our system, even though they might regard it as chaotic and conflicted and falling apart and short term. Let's understand one thing about China. They think 50 years is quite a, quite a short time in history because they're actually a much older civilization than Western European civilization. Um, but... Um, uh, and, and they can't quite understand why we're so successful, I would say, in other respects, um, why we're so creative, and they envy that, and they're trying to catch us up. But in these tensions, uh, there is far more to be gained, uh, I think, from uh, the strand of thinking that's coming from this panel so far, that there's far more to be gained from, from cooperation and, um, and, uh, try and persuasion than confrontation. But, um, I mean, we need to recognize some things for what they are. The, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, presented by President Xi as a very green initiative, has definitely been a, um, a kind of mercantilist economic enterprise to extend Chinese influence. Um, uh, the, what they call debt trap diplomacy has trapped um, some countries, for example, Sri Lanka, almost into, into the ownership of Chinese financial institutions and indirectly to the Chinese state. Um, so we've got to strike a balance um, in the aftermath of the Golden Age policy um, uh, between um, um, firmness and clarity and um, cooperation and persuasion. And, and, and I'll just end on this point. The integrated review of defense and security policy describes China as a strategic competitor. It is less clear in the paper or elsewhere what that really means in practice. I suggest that investment in secure supply chains, which is something you asked me to address, which I will just very briefly address, um, uh, is a means of resecuring our financial independence. Our, our the, the way we live our economies has got to be um, uh, given a little bit more sovereignty. We're seeing the restoration of um, the importance of onshore capability for providing for our own economies. Um, and I, I think I agree with um, uh, um, um, forgive me, um, Rebecca, um, that if we're going to do carbon border adjustments, and th there is out there, if you do Bernard Jenkin carbon border adjustments, you'll find it on the internet. I support the principle of carbon border adjustments, but they shouldn't be seen as a punishment. Absolutely not. They should be seen as a universal mechanism for um, addressing the accusation that we are simply offshoring our, our, our carbon emissions, um, importing coal-fired electricity, importing carbon-produced seal um, and, and cement. The, you know, we, need to, we need to reflect the costs of carbon, of carbon in our supply chains, and China should want to do the same, and it should be seen as part of the cooperation. And I just end on this point. I was very pleased to hear reference from James about um, uh, um, um, having um, um, an integrated national strategy and a whole-of-government approach. Uh, there's another video out there by me 
came out, uh, <laughs> came out just a fortnight ago, or t uh, 12 days ago. If you Google Bernard Jenkin hot debate YouTube, you'll see I'm making a big pitch that government needs a much more integrated approach, not just to climate change, but to every aspect of national policy, addressing technology, making much better use of data, and having a permanent impartial mechanism that ensures that ministers are much more, much better informed by policy choices uh, than they seem to be informed at the moment, and trying to reconcile some of the conflicting goals uh, that we have in our domestic politics, because we're only going to be able to lead as a country on climate change if we're setting the best example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. And this is being live streamed, so hopefully in future events you can reference this event as well, so we get more <laughs> traffic. To this. Um, last, but not last but not least, we've got Mark Logan, who is newly, well, it's not that new anymore, but with COVID, was elected in the last um, election as the MP for Bolton North East. Before that, he actually worked in China at the British Consulate General in Shanghai, um, and he's now also vice chair of the APPG on China. So it'd be particularly interesting to get your perspective as someone who's actually worked in China, and also on the role that international trade plays in this whole debate. Great, thank you very much, uh, Laura. And uh, I thought, Bernard, it was, it was great to follow your good self, and I was thinking, I'll not put you on the spot, but I was wondering if you had a communications officer, uh, because you're really good at uh, comms. And uh, I, 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 need to, I need to learn a, a trick or two. Um, but also, I was thinking from the audience perspective, I, and I'm not sure if the CEN, Laura, has done this on purpose, but it kind of looks almost that we're, we've gone left to, to right slightly, I think, in terms of opinion. So I, I, I may fit in slightly OK on, on this side of the, the fence for this discussion today. I will only take a couple of minutes just to make a, a few um, very simple um, points. The, the first one is that um, I think, again, the title that we chose for today's session was very provocative, and it, and it worked really well because when I posted it on LinkedIn, for example, I got a lot of people sending me a messages saying, how, how, dare, how dare they choose this, this word challenge? We should be cooperating with China as much as possible when it comes to, to uh, climate change. But what I would say is to really up, up the ante in terms of ambition is that this should be a race to the top uh, when it comes to either the bilateral relationship between UK and China on climate change or indeed with the EU, United States and other partners like, uh, like India. Um, the second point that I would like to make just on this is um, around this idea in, in recent weeks, I've been taking an increasing interest on this, but this idea of uh, governance through sloganeering um, and in China for, for many years, um, and like Richard, I, was, I worked in, and lived there for, for quite a long time. And um, I used to be very cynical of um, what I would have deemed uh, propaganda that you would see on these large red posters and the big white uh, hands that, that you see a lot of times in all parts, cities, uh, towns and countryside across China. But in the last couple of years, I've, I've came to discover, probably like a lot of people, that Perhaps when the CCP have talked about socialism with Chinese characteristics, um, or right now when they're talking about common prosperity, or indeed Shuang uh, Xunhuan with the, um, the changes now in, in their economy, is that they might actually mean what they, are, what they are saying. So my appeal would be at the UK side, as we look to develop um, a bit more meat on the bones of some of the clear ambitions that we have as a conservative government in this um, in this parliament like so my own seat in Bolton North East just 25 30 minutes up the road is that very much so it's all about leveling up um, I would say in the case of China there's probably never been a greater example of leveling up that has existed in in mankind um, over the last uh, 30 to 40 years but it does have its own problems when it comes to the, the border, uh, the hinterlands and the, uh, the coastal regions. Um, but also, when it comes to foreign policy, this idea around global Britain. And I think much in the same way as like in over the last 50 to 60 years, it would be impossible to talk about any major um, global, political, economic, diplomatic issue without talking about the United States um, and I think that today and in the decades to come, the same is going to apply 
when it comes to China. So now is not a time to be breaking off uh, relations with China um, across a, a multitude of different, uh, different levels. Um, and then the fa final point that I would just like to make is, uh, and I think it was in, in response to a question I'd just been sent um, before today, was, was this idea around trade with, uh, with China from the UK's perspective. And I think that for many years there has been a, a, a deal that we've, we've had, um, perhaps um, slightly more tentatively at times, but between the West, so the United States, for example, is uh, researching and, and designing certain new products. And then you've had Germany in the middle of this, um, and then China at the other end in terms of its ability to scale up. And I think that when it comes to the supply chains to uh, Bernard's point earlier, but also in trading, and we mentioned the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism also, I think that there will have to be a lot of work um, for governments at COP26 when we come to Glasgow, but uh, it's only an event in itself, and I think it'll definitely be in the, the weeks and months after that to try and find a new way <coughs> to collaborate on this issue. Because, for example, the European Union's current plans on the CBAM hasn't been received that well um, within, uh, within the Chinese context. So again, to James's point a bit earlier on, it would be interesting to see the diplomacy side of that and how that ends up. Um, so just finally, Laura, I, um, I would just say that I think that when we look at China and when it comes to climate change is that of course we can apply some international nudging when it uh, comes to trying to guide China's policy, but more important than the international dimension will be the domestic parts, and, and Rebecca rightly mentioned that early on. Um, for example, the power outages that we've just had in the last week or two in China, where 21 or more provinces, um, because they're trying to meet certain targets, have decided to uh, effectively switch off um, the, the switch. And uh, I'll stop there, because I, I think you'll learn much more probably from the question and answer session. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we're now moving on to Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, get them ready. Um, but we'll kick off with a very quick um, fire round, saying if you could speak to Xi Jinping, what is the advice you would give him with regard to climate change? And what would the one policy be that you would ask him to adopt? So building on this <coughs> domestic policy approach, Mark. I'll just come in uh, very, very quickly on that. I, I think for these last few decades, um, the Communist Party of China, a lot of its legitimacy has been based on its b ability to give prosperity um, to its people. Um, Bernard mentioned rightly um, just five to ten minutes ago, actually, if you look at the Harvard University Ash Institute, it had a um, survey about three to four years ago. It was asking, um, what's your approval ratings for the Communist Party of China amongst Chinese citizens? And I think the rating was 85, 90, or it could have even been higher at 95%. Um, I know some people in the audience will be skeptical about this. I, I think from my experiences there and also academic interest in China that that's probably very accurate in terms of the, the support and, uh, and the Conservative Party. We only wish we had approval ratings as, as high as that. We have to work much harder. Um, so I think that where that prosperity, that's been part of the deal between the state and society, the party state and society, is that I, I would be saying to um, China's leadership, um, both openly and, and off record, to actually see green, uh, green technology, green finance, the green economy, see that as you know, a potentially new and important pillar of ensuring that you have stability when it comes to the China's political economy in the wider region. Yeah, I think this is a really good question. What would we all say to Xi Jinping? And I think what I would do uh, with uh, Xi Jinping would be to encourage him to move more in the direction that he and China are already moving in. So what they've done on these foreign coal-powered stations, great. Let's do the same thing domestically. And part of what Mark was saying is absolutely right. There is this inbuilt tension between the fact that to deliver the economic growth <coughs> and the jobs that enable the Communist Party in China to carry on campaigning effectively under Macmillan's slogan of you've never had it so good, that's the legitimacy on which their power is based, 
there is this worry that by moving too fast in a green direction, then there will be electricity outages, uh, the standards of living may drop. That's their fundamental political concern. And I think the important thing is to encourage them to think of the new jobs that will come out of a greener China. And that, I hope, is what they'll very much lead on at Kunming in the spring uh, when they have the biodiversity uh, conference there. And that, that is the opportunity ahead. It's not that dissimilar uh, from the opportunity ahead for us if we follow in the directions of making a greener economy. So, encouragement. Thanks. Thank you. Bernard. I think the first thing that I'd want to do would be not to say anything but to demonstrate uh, that the West um, is capable of working with non-democratic countries because we're going to have to do that in a lot of cases, the majority of cases, um, in order to achieve global warming and to listen, to listen to what he's got to say. If I said anything, I would want to ask him about the disorder and chaos that marked his childhood, which was the Cultural Revolution, and try and join him in a conversation about what happens if we don't defeat climate change because that disorder and chaos will revisit every part of the world and not just, not, not just the low-lying areas because the political chaos will precede the, uh, the most severe part of the climate chaos. And he understands that, I think. Um, and everything he's doing is driving towards maintaining order and maintaining stability. Stability is a watchword of his speeches. And um, finally, I would encourage him to use the incredible influence that the Communist Party of China has with its population to persuade the Chinese people that they can go much further and faster. And of course, the policy goal must be, at the moment, peak coal is projected to be about 2049. That is far too late if we're going to do net zero by 2050. Um, and most of that coal is now being dug up in China. Um, we need to get them off coal. And they've got the resources and the, and the um, technology to get off coal much more quickly if they put their minds to it and they persuade their people of its necessity. Um, and we're not going to defeat global warming unless we get them off coal. Uh, but they've got to do it for themselves. We can't do it for them. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands. I'm going to move on to... Oh, let's... There are hands. I was scanning the room. Um, I've got lots up my sleeve as well, but <coughs> lady in the green, best. Thank you. Um, I, um, I have now worked for two companies who manufacture primarily in China, um, one of whom um, is very good on environmental issues and one of whom was very bad on environmental issues um, in terms of they just didn't care. Um, are, as conservatives, are we not missing a trick by using the thousands of businesses that manufacture in China to actually demand that they look through their supply chains and um, ask that they demand the highest standards of the people they are actually using to manufacture in China? Because you can, if you could have five minutes with Xi Jinping, um, I'm sure that would be great, but Xi Jinping isn't running a factory in um, uh, that's manufacturing goods for the British market, and money talks, as we know. Thank you. Let's just couple that up with the gentleman in the front. Or one guy at the back. Oh, thank you. One there. Yeah, um, I have another question about how we navigate the minefield of the other issues that cause a significant friction between China and the West, like the human rights problems, Hong Kong, etc., etc. Uh, and while having that dialogue about the climate change, because if you go off what those Chinese diplomats been, uh, say quite a lot, they do have a kind of an all or nothing type of attitude. But we saw where John Kerry visited, I think it's Foreign Minister Wang Yi recently, I think. Uh, it was an interesting much dialogue without addressing the ever-growing list of grievances between the US and China. So, I mean, how do we navigate between the two since it's so intertwined these days, it seems to be? Right. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to tackle that first question about higher demands in the supply chains? I think I think I see this as a question sort of relating to the UK's consumption emissions, so the emissions embedded in the products that uh, we use, consume in the UK, 
um, as a result of global supply chains. And I think, I mean, to be honest, I think this comes back round to um, some of the, que the points that the panel has already made about leading by example in the UK, because we have to, we have to still think about the global dynamics and the, p the, the politics around this. So if the, the, at the moment the UK doesn't actually have a, uh, a track record of delivering on its existing uh, climate targets. We do have some uh, relatively world-leading climate targets, but we are not delivering on them. And so until we can genuinely show that we're leading by example, um, coming in with more punitive measures, I would say, to, towards China uh, is going to go down badly and it just won't work. So that's not to say that we couldn't, um, that there couldn't be some advantage to having a collaborative conversation with China about some uh, adjustments in the trade system to account for consumption emissions. But that needs to be done in a collaborative way um, and it needs to be kind of done as a part of a wider package that will actually be benefit China. James, you wanted to come in on that first question. I just want to make one point. I, I, I don't want it to be misunderstood when I was speaking earlier to say that, that carbon borders are only a punitive measure. I agree with uh, Bernard that they can also be used in other ways as well. And in this context, in relation to your question, I think the important point here is that uh, you know, we are in control of what comes in and goes out of our own country. So if we want to enhance the extraterritorial reach of our own legislation, our own domestic legislation, <coughs> that is to say to ensure that the products that come into our country are produced with the highest environmental standards, the same that our companies would be expected to apply here, then that's something I think that we should be very prepared to uh, legislate for. And it's only through, uh, through understanding this, um, this extraterritorial reach and the importance of it that we can actually get to grips with this situation. Uh, just very briefly, I think very important just to signal we're not going to carry on buying this stuff if it's very carbon intensive. It's just not going to happen one way or another. Carbon border adjustments are actually a very complicated business. If, if you were, We couldn't do it by domestic legislation. We'd have to do it through the WTO. Otherwise, we'd be in breach of WTO agreements. And the United States is going to be a big problem on this. Um, and there's another example of completely conflicting policies. We, we want to do a free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, they don't attach nearly so much importance to dealing with the carbon problem as, uh, as we do. Um, that is a, an, a conflict we've got to have to reconcile. I'm personally in favor of a free trade agreement with the United States, but it must um, reflect the global priorities. So th I think there's a, there's a positive and a negative message. And also the, the, the negative message is it's, it's nothing to do with what I want or you want, Mr. President. Uh, uh, we are heading into a, a, um, a, um, a half century of massive instability and unpredictability. And unless we try and deal with the carbon question, uh, together, uh, you are going to be engulfed by it just as much as we're going to be engulfed by it, and us not buying your stuff will be just one small part of it. Um, Mark and Richard wanted to come into the question of this gentleman in front. Yeah, can I can I come in on on your questions? Front, how do we basically have different levels and types of conversation on different issues? I think that was at the core of your question, and there's a good section in the integrated review where it talks openly about the challenges of engaging with China in a whole range of different ways. So it talks about being a partner, being a competitor, being a challenger, and cooperating. And you know we can partner on the environment in the ways that some of us were suggesting. We can challenge on security, and we can cooperate on trade and investment with the caveat around the security bill that's gone through. And the interesting thing in all of this is that we have, as a nation, slightly lost our ability for nuance. Mm. If you look at how Japan and South Korea engage with China, you'll see it's broadly full steam ahead on trade and investment. When it comes to security and threats, for example, to navigation in the South China Sea, they have deep concern, and they will challenge, and they will partner with other countries who share those concerns. But we have rather lost that ability to understand that you can have different types of conversation and dialogue on different issues in the same way that all of us do at home and within the party. And that is a problem. It's in the House of Commons that the problem is. We want to identify people as goodies and baddies. If they're goodies, we'll stick with them through thick and thin. Did we give America a hard time when Trump pulled out of the, the Paris Climate Agreement? Not really, no. But when it comes to the baddies, 
we're not going to really give them any credit at all. Have we seen a great deal of response in newspapers like the Daily Telegraph applauding, for example, China's commitments to stop financing coal-fired plants abroad? No, not really. So we've got to be more supple and more nuanced, and we can have those conversations. You can be very blunt, in my experience of 41 years of working in and with China, you can be very blunt privately. It's all about the tone and that suppleness. Thanks. Mark, and then we'll catch your questions. Yeah, uh, so d just very briefly, I think w when you look at the US and the China uh, bilateral relationship, it's been on a downward trajectory for even before uh, Donald Trump became president, so for like six or seven years. Um, the slight worry with UK-China relations is that we've condensed that six, seven years of their experience into the last year and a half or two years. Um, and the issue I think that we should uh, be worried about when it comes to, to statecraft is that there isn't enough consistency in what we're doing, and it's also making us um, very unpredictable. So where we've earlier, we talked about the golden era, and that there was a huge amount of skepticism, both in Whitehall and across the country when it, when it comes to the golden era, but we've gone to the other end of the spectrum now, and I, what I would be calling for is, is a balanced era of, uh, of some sort when it comes to the bilateral relationship between the UK and with China, because at the minute, and I spoke with someone preparing for today, who's actually a Chinese national who works on climate change, and they were saying the, ex the exact same thing, basically, is that they don't really know how to tech the UK at the moment. Um, and the Chinese perspective is that, and I think this is to, to answer your, your question, is how do you juggle these competing interests, is that the Chinese and Wang Yi um, um, at the China side is very much focused on you know, saying that you can't decouple these issues. And I know in the Western stances that we're saying that you can decouple these issues. But I think no matter what perspective <coughs> you take is that climate change could be that vehicle for us to try and get the bilateral and different multilateral relations um, back on track. Great, now we've got five minutes left, so we'll capture quick questions. Five, five. all the hands gone up now at the very end. So the gentleman in the back had his hand up from the very start. So, yes, sir. We'll cut the stop. Nope, nope, nope. Behind, yeah. Behind you. Behind you. Behind you. Yeah. Great. Can I, can I ask you, what do you make of the sort of general political trends in China, the almost sort of North Koreanization of China, which has been going on with the foundation of Xi Jinping thought, him being president for life, the Chinese nationalism is, is always there, but it's a bit more explicit now with the threats against Taiwan. I mean, could, how do you deal with these very difficult issues when you're dealing with another massive issue? Well, can I give you, can, can I offer a quick one word answer? Look, that's a huge topic, sir. You've ranged a massive <laughs> number of things. <laughs> Look, the, I mean, I think the simple answer is that the space for debating and thinking creatively about alternative solutions to problems in China has definitely decreased. And everyone in China is very conscious of that. And it's not an encouraging feature. But there are still voices of reason who are open to alternative ideas. And the important thing is to be able to find them and engage with them. Thank you, gentlemen with a microphone. Thank you for the panel uh, giving the very broad views. I think still, it is still uh, unclear for the businesses to understand what we can do and what we can't do with China in the climate change. I think we touch very broadly on many things, such as policy, uh, uh, Education, R and D, innovation, business collaboration, etc. But, but but when down to the reality, people still confuse what we can do and what we can't do. People somehow feel nervous talking with China. So can we give a little bit more guidance, clearer guidance, what we can do and what, what and what we can't do? And we'll just take the lady um, in the back there, uh, if that's possible. And um, there's also a question online because there's there's people at home watching. Um, and one of them is asking, Daniel. how do we pressure them? Because asking them nicely so far has done very little, uh, considering they're producing most of CO2. And should the UK cooperate institutionally with the EU to tackle the challenge China on climate change? But we'll add to that Hello. yours. I am, I'm just saying that because in the world we have got a lot of continent. China is the only, not only one. The in, a, in a moment, the Africa the largest continent in the world, they are suffering maximum. Their Madagascar has gone 
to drought. Madagascar is the one of the... So, what is your question, madam? My question, your environment, environment network, environment, the drastically climate change is affecting maximum in Africa. Africa used to be the maximum jungle. When I was a little girl, I used to know that Africa is a huge country and they have got lots of trees and things and natural beauty. But now Africa, okay. lots of place in Africa, now in drought, they yeah. can't eat, they are dying. You were saying about Ch China, China. China is the richest country in the world than um, USA. They are not the on only two countries in the world. There's Thank you, Madam. I think we've got the gist of that question. So, so you can hear replies very finely, the gentleman in the front. Uh, no, okay, that's it. On to answers, and then um, and then that's a wrap. I think we'll do this instead of closing remarks. So, who would like to take them first? Uh, great. Yeah, so I, I think there were so many questions there. It's very hard to sum them all up. But I just want to make one very simple point, and it is a simple point, but it's one that I think we should always remember. You know, the Chinese Communist Party is an authoritarian regime, and a deeply authoritarian regime at that. It is incredibly solipsistic. It acts only for its own interests, and its primary interest is to maintain power. And everything else that it does in relation to that will be um, a consequence of it. So we must always keep that in mind when we're making policy. Um, in answer to the... I would never compare China with North Korea, and I don't think we should talk about the North Koreanization of China. Um, I think we should... Um, be very firm, courteous, and firm and clear about what we find unacceptable in the treatment of the Ouija's, for example. And we should be very unspecific about what we would do in response to some attack on Taiwan. Uh, deterrence works best when you don't specify what you're going to do. But we should we should be adding to the uncertainty of what China's what the consequences would be if China behaves very badly. But we have to accept China doesn't have much respect for the international institutions that have been constructed by the West in the wake of World War II. Uh, they think they see them as creatures of Western powers. They don't feel bound by international law. And we're going to have to uh, respond accordingly to that. And we're going to have a very difficult time because, madam, the African countries, uh, at the moment, they probably trust China much more than they do the ex-colonial powers. Um, though one might describe what China is doing in much of Africa as colonization. Um, and But that, I think we, we have to understand the instability that um, uh, President Xi feels he is constantly confronted by. But I would say there were two things I would just add at the end of this, which is um, how do we deal with threats coming from China? Consistency. We have to be consistent. We have to win back respect that there is a construct called the West that is coherent and consistent because we've lost it at the moment, particularly after Afghanistan. And consistency means joining up with the EU, joining up with the United States, joining up with India, joining up with as many countries as possible and making it look like a non-Western alliance of consistent policy demonstrating interests uh, in the international order. And... Um, uh, all, uh, and, and finally, in terms of more guidance for business, I'm afraid business has got to live in the real world. There are going to be political risks investing in China, political risks that don't exist in nice, safe countries like the United Kingdom or the United States. Now, that's, your, that's what you've got to contend with. There's no easy answer to that. Um, and we can't guarantee a risk-free investment scenario for investing in China just by set giving a, bit, a few bits of guidance. We don't know what China's going to do. We don't know what other countries are going to do. Um, so don't, don't you make your own assessment of political risk. Don't rely on governments to insulate you from risk. Thank you. Now, final sentences from Rebecca and Mark. Uh, yeah, final sentence, which uh, speaks to some of the questions. Yeah, it's not just about China. Um, I think we need to think about providing more support for the G77 in particular, which in turn will help to influence China as well. So that means actually making good on international climate finance commitments. Um, in the UK, we can still do more. Our, currently, our, com our contribution to international climate finance is coming entirely from the aid budget, which has also been cut. 
So there's much more we can also do to set a good example and build positive momentum. Uh, and then just very briefly to the gentleman who asked a question, um, all right, the implicit on the authoritarianism. Um, I think it's important to remember that even the, the Communist Party of China and its leadership are also listening and trying to be responsive um, to the public, sometimes if, if not more, because as people often say um, is that the Chinese leadership is incredibly um, scared at times um, about uh, its, its own people and how they react to its own uh, responsiveness. And actually a good example of that, I mean, on Taiwan, for example, um, a number of years ago, whenever Xi Jinping was seen as being quite dovish on the issue, he had a huge amount of backlash online, and some people have inferred that that's maybe attended then to him having a, a stronger policy when it comes to Taiwan. Um, but also the same comes to climate change, because there is actually a movement which I was never aware of before when I was based in China, but there's a bit of a kind of Trumpian anti climate change movement that's also started online within China um, and again that might be something that would be interesting to look at public opinion and how that does or doesn't influence Chinese uh, leaders policy making decisions great so Laura here's my go uh, one last sentence on this one so seek more detail from them on their existing commitments encourage their domestic policy on coal to align with their foreign allow the developing countries to make the most powerful case for why further change in China is necessary, and for us, work really closely on making massive joint financial commitments to renewable energy across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, James, Rebecca, Bernard, and Mark. And um, thank you very much for joining the session. The next uh, session in this very room is on financing nature at 4.30, so stick around. And please do um, follow Sen, all the information is here, but also you can become a supporter and you'll um, receive lots of interesting information and of activities that are happening and ramping up ahead of COP26. Well Thank done, you all. Well